Tulsa Zoo, and we've got a really exciting program for you today. We're going to learn all about some animal adaptations that we can find in the Star Wars universe. Pretty cool. Are you ready? All right, let's get started. But before we get into our planets of the Star Wars universe, we kind of have to learn about what an adaptation is, right? Does anybody know out there? What is an adaptation? Well, an adaptation is something that the animal has or something an animal does that helps them survive better in the wild. For example, right here, this big funny bone, this is from a giraffe neck. And as you know, giraffe's necks are huge, very long, long necks. And that's a special adaptation that giraffes have to help them eat the leaves at the very, very tops of the trees. Now, the other animals in the savanna don't have that adaptation, right? So they have an advantage or an edge over those other animals, right? They can get those leaves at the top and the other animals can't, right? Pretty cool bone, right? The giraffe has seven of these in their neck and they actually have the same amount as most mammals, right? So people being mammals, we have vertebrae in our neck as well, and we have seven, but a giraffe's neck bones or vertebrae are much, much larger, right? Because my head, right? Awesome. Now, another adaptation that some animals have, this is an owl skull, check that out, an owl skull. And if you notice, you can see those huge holes right here, and that's where their eyes would go. Now, remember, owls are, uh, active at night or nocturnal, okay? So they are going to have those huge eyes so they collect a lot of light at night so they can see better, okay? Pretty cool. Now also, they see really well. They'll be able to see about a mouse about a football field away. So a pretty amazing skill that they have. But since their eyes are so large, they actually don't have the muscles to be able to move their eyes. And that's where you hear about owls being able to turn their heads so well, <clears throat> okay? So let's do a little experiment. If you guys can all look forward for me, look forward, all right? And without moving your head, try to look over in that direction. You can do it, right? All right, now try the other direction. Yeah, you can do that, right? Well, owls can't do that, and that's why they have to move their heads. So their eyes are stationary, stuck in their heads, so they would have to turn their heads, okay? And a lot of people believe they can turn their heads 360 degrees around, and they can't actually turn it that far, but they can see that far around. So they can turn their heads all the way around and maybe face that direction, about 270. But they have range of vision about 360 degrees all the way around their heads. Pretty cool. So let's go ahead and dive in to those Star Wars planets, okay? And our first planet everybody's familiar with is Hoth. Check that out. Now this, of course, is the location of Echo Base, one of the rebel bases. And Echo, uh, Echo Base is really set in a harsh climate so they could stay hidden. Now Hoth, the planet Hoth, is super, super cold, right? Very, very cold, very icy planet. There's another picture of that. Not lots around. Now, does anybody remember any animals that lived on Hoth? Right, you saw one in those pictures. We have the Tauntaun, right? The Tauntaun lives on Hoth. Now, the Tauntaun does have some pretty amazing adaptations to be able to survive there, right? Check out these feet. These feet are huge, all right? And big feet allow this animal not to sink down into the snow and just stay on the surface so they can stay there. Did you know that these tauntauns, they can run 90 kilometers per hour? Wow, that's really, really, really fast. And I guess that's why 
um, Luke Skywalker and Han Solo used to ride them, right? Those rebels used to use them as um, transportation, right? Now, another adaptation that these guys have, if you can see it, they actually have four nostrils, and that's to help keep their temperature. If they are running really hard and um, need a lot of air, they can use those four nostrils to breathe, but if it's a little bit colder out, they can shut those nostrils and just use one set so they don't release as much heat, all right? Now, one thing that I'm missing, what is this guy covered in? He's covered in fur, of course, and that helps him stay warm in the cold, hot environment. Now, this guy has to watch out for somebody else. The Wampus, one of my favorite characters here, right? The Wampus, of course, caught a Tauntaun that Luke Skywalker was riding, my brother, right? So, the Wampus has huge paws so they can catch those Tauntauns. They also have really sharp teeth so they can grab hold of their prey and eat them down, right? And again, they're covered with thick white fur. Now, of course, that white fur does keep them warm, but it also helps as camouflage, okay? Now, a couple of animals that we have here on Earth that have some of the same adaptations as animals on Hoth, because remember, we have some very cold environments here on Earth as well. We call them tundras or high up in the mountains. Some animals here have some of those same adaptations, like this animal right here. This is from a snow leopard, right? And you can see this warm, thick fur that they have to keep them warm in the cold uh, mountains of Nepal, okay? Now also check out that pattern that they have. This pattern makes them virtually invisible in their natural environment. They blend in really well, and that is really helpful when you're trying to stalk your prey, right? You're completely hidden, your prey doesn't know you're coming. Another animal we have are snowy owls. And this is a foot from a snowy owl. And snowy owls, a lot of owls out there do not have feathers that cover their feet. However, a snowy owl does. And that's so their feet stay nice and warm in the brutal cold environment that they live in. And one last one that lives in the tundra here. Of course, there's lots of animals, but an example that I have is this guy. Can anybody guess what this might be? This one reminds me of the wampa. This is from a polar bear, right? Polar bears have huge teeth and that gives them the ability to eat lots and lots of different animals that live in the Arctic, right? So they can eat whales and all sorts of things that live up there. They can actually pull whales right out of the water. Now they do have that very streamlined head, very sleek, that's hydrodynamic so they can swim through the water and get around up there in the tundra. Pretty cool. Now we do have a special guest coming on to visit us. Miss Claire is going to bring us a friend from Earth. <laughs> hello, hello Earthlings. So I have here a familiar looking creature. This is a chinchilla. So right here, this is Harley Chin, the chinchilla. And you might recognize this chinchilla shares a lot of the same adaptations as some of our other earthly creatures and also some of the aliens we talked about. So taking a look at Harley, do you notice something about her? Maybe how big, fluffy, and round she is? So she shares the same adaptation as maybe those tauntauns and the wampa and our snow leopards. She is covered in dense fur. So what's incredible about this dense fur is that for each hair follicle, she can have up to 20 hairs in each hair follicle. That's a lot of hair. And another adaptation with that hair, let's say a predator's coming after Harley, oh no! What's she gonna do? She can actually drop her hair. So have you ever had your cat's hair in your mouth or your own hair? You know it's very uncomfortable. So a predator would go like, oh no, I don't wanna eat that. Harley here can be found up in the Andes Mountains in South America. So that's why she needs this dense fur. She also has something really cool with her feet similar to the Tauntaun. Not sure if you can see him, but she has long, flat feet, perfect for jumping and doing some awesome parkour trips up in the mountainous area. So that is Harley Chin, our chinchilla from Earth. And I think we're gonna move on to another planet here. So Princess Katie, would you like to come back? 
Hello. All right. So that was a really cool animal. Remember, Hoth is super cold, unforgiving, icy planet. Um, we also have those environments here on Earth, right? Like the tundra or up in the Andes Mountains. It's very cold. Um, but our next planet is vastly dinner, different. Still very harsh environment, but still very different from our last one. And of course, you might have already guessed it. It is Tatooine. Tatooine is, of course, the birthplace or home planet of both Anakin Skywalker and Luke Skywalker, right? But you can see it is a very desolate environment. Super, super, super hot and super, super, super dry. And one of the reasons is it is so hot there is because they do actually have two suns. Oh my goodness, two suns make it very, very hot. Now the animals that live in Tatu on Tatooine do have to be adapted to that desert environment. And one of the most scariest animals out there, of course, is the Sarlacc. All right, now the Sarlacc, we can just see on the surface of the sand is his mouth, all right? But under the sand lies something far larger. So if we look at a cross section, this is the Sarlacc. He buries himself in the sand and his body remains underground with just his mouth hanging out so he can eat things. Mmm, yum. Another animal from Tatooine is the dewback. All right, now of course you might have seen some stormtroopers riding the dewback as they are domesticated, but the dewback are completely adapted to their Tatooine environment. They do have that thick, scaly skin, which helps retain moisture so they don't lose it. Remember, water is very valuable in a desert situation. All right. They also have those large mouths so they can chomp down um, bushes all at once on one bite because they are herbivores where they only eat plant material. Okay. And there's not a lot of opportunity to eat plants in a desert. So when the opportunity is there, they have to eat it quickly so others can't find it. Okay. Now, of course, we do have desert environments here on Earth, and a lot of animals have adaptations to help them survive here, okay? Now, one of those animals is this guy, okay? This is a girdle lizard, and you can see that this animal is covered with spiny scales, and those spiny scales, of course, help protect them, okay? but they also help retain that moisture that they would lose from the desert sun, okay? Now, this is a really cool animal because not only does it have that scaly skin, but when it gets scared or threatened, it would actually bite the end of its tail and form a little ball, kind of like an armadillo, and they are known as armadillo girdle lizards. Pretty cool. Now, this guy right here, uses a bit of the same strategy as the sarlacc. So at, in the daytime, all right, these guys are going to bury themselves just like that sarlacc. A lot of animals in the desert do like to go underground during the hot of the day. It's very, very hot, so they like to get away from that sun. But at nighttime, they will come out of their underground layers. Okay, scorpion. Another animal that is all very famous for living in the desert are rattlesnakes. And again, rattlesnakes have this thick, scaly skin to help retain that moisture and they won't lose it, okay? Reptiles do really well in desert environments because they get their energy, a lot of energy, from the sun, okay? And they love to get hot and warm. All right, let's go ahead and meet another friend from a desert environment. Hello again. So I have a tiny reptile here. This is Glitter the Chihuahua. So these guys are actually quite unique. You can find them in the southwestern part of the United States and even down a little bit southern in Mexico and parts of Central America. So these guys have a funny name, Chuck Walla, 
but they also have a couple of those fun adaptations we talked about in our alien species and our other earthly creatures. So, like Princess Katie was talking about, dewback and our rattlesnakes and all our other uh, scaly creatures, they have scales, which are perfect for uh, making sure that the moisture doesn't get out. This guy doesn't drink a lot of water because of where he lives. He's gonna be found in the desert. These guys also pretty much are only herbivores. They eat just flowers, fruit, cactuses, anything that might have a little bit of moisture in them. And what's also really fun about this little creature is you might be able to tell he's a little puffy right now. We talked about the girdle lizard and how they had some fun adaptations. So glitter's not gonna curl up in a ball. Glitter's gonna do a little something different. All chuckawallas, if they feel threatened, they're gonna do one of the funniest adaptations I've ever seen. They're gonna take a big deep breath and they're going to puff up. Glitter's puffing up just a little bit. He's not that worried right now, but he could puff up three times his size. Can you believe that? So if a predator is chasing after him, this little guy can run in between the cracks of some rocks inflate and then the predator can't get to them. There's not enough room to get them out. Another cool thing is a lot of people like to call these guys cold-blooded. So it means that doesn't mean that they have cold blood. Instead, it means that these guys are going to be the same temperature as it is outside. So their inside body heat is dependent on the weather outside. So today our glitter would probably have a great time with the hot day we're gonna have today. So that was glitter, our chuckawalla from Earth. All right, guys, now we need you to help us out a little bit. What we want for you to do is gather your art supplies, all right? So you could have crayons or Play-Doh or googly eyes, construction paper, tissue paper, whatever craft supplies you have lying around. If you don't have any craft supplies, that's okay too. Just have a sheet of paper, just blank paper and a pencil. You can do the same thing for our activity. What we want you to do, we are looking for some new creatures for our Star Wars universe and we want you to create them. Now think about those uh, planets that we were talking about earlier. So we talked about Hoth and we talked about Tatch Me. Now you need to design an animal that will fit on one of those planets, okay? Make sure that those animals have the adaptations that they need to survive on those planets. Because you wouldn't want to put an animal with huge thick fur on a hot environment, right? Because they wouldn't do very well, right? We want to have good adaptations so that animal can survive and thrive in that environment, okay? All right, and we are going to have some examples by our Starfighter Claire. So I had a lot of fun creating some new aliens. First, I'm going to show you my favorite one. This right here is what I like to call a flu fluff fluff. So I imagine this creature would probably be the best suited to be in Hoth. You might be able to tell some of the adaptations that we talked about. Look at how big and fluffy it is. He's not gonna have to worry about being cold out in that tundra. You can also take a look at his big feet. He is probably gonna be doing a great job running around on that ice and snow because he has a lot of weight distribution. And lastly, you can take a look. He's probably not going to be a predator. Look at his tiny arms. He's not going to be able to hunt. He is going to be grazing on grasses and maybe some other Arctic vegetation. And then right here, this guy is also my favorite. He, I want to call him a slump. Uh, I think he'd be aquatic. What's that one planet called? Dagobah. Dagobah. So this would be a Dagobah or maybe a swampy place. Dagobah. <laughs> I really like Dagobah. <laughs> and so he has some gills, he has some big eyeballs, and he got some fun frills on top. And last but not least, I decided to craft something out of Play-Doh. This guy right here, this guy's really fun. I'm going to put him really close. So he is brightly colored. I think this guy would probably do a good job of living on Tatooine because he is scaly. I tried my best to put some cool scales on him. He also has a snake-like serpent tail. A lot of snakes live in the desert, so I thought he probably would do a pretty good job. And then last but not least, I gave him some fangs. 
So he's probably going to be eating some really tasty prey. So those are my little creations. Did I, I didn't tell you the name for this guy. I think I'm gonna name him, um, I think it was Zook, Zookzo, Zookzo. Can't remember, but I like the name of that guy too. All right, Miss Claire, are you ready for a challenge? Yeah. All right, I'm gonna give her a challenge and have her make one of our animals right here with us today, okay? And I'm gonna say that she has to make an animal for the planet of Naboo, right? The planet of Naboo is where my mother comes from, all right? And Naboo is a beautiful, temperate, beautiful weather planet, um, great, not too hot, not too cold, perfect weather. It also is covered with vast oceans, all right? Jar Jar Binks loves to swim down in the oceans uh, where his uh, village is, and these oceans are huge. The oceans are filled with terribly huge, scary sea creatures, right? So very large predators, right? So I'm gonna challenge Miss Claire to go ahead and design one of those animals right here. Mm. So because this planet is made mostly of water, I think I'm going to make an aquatic type of animal. And I thought, what better way for an animal to have a really cool adaptation than to be the same color as water. So we're gonna work with blue Play-Doh. And Princess Katie mentioned that there's probably a lot of predators out on this island. So I think I'm gonna make a huge aquatic predator. I'm gonna make them have a really big mouth. Rawr! And let's see, so it's aquatic. So do you think it's gonna have arms or fins? I think fins would work better. But I'm out of blue, so let's see. I think I'm going to use some white because there's also some maybe white colors. Sharks sometimes have white underbellies. So when a uh, prey looks up, they see white that kind of matches the sky from underneath. So I'm gonna give him a white underbelly too. He's looking pretty good. And let's see. I think I'm also gonna give him a big fin on top. And then last but not least, this guy has to see, right? I think I'm gonna use googly eyes and put some big googly eyes on this fellow. Oh, I love this guy. So he's probably gonna be kind of similar to a serpent. He doesn't have big fins on the side of him but he's gonna be good at just gobbling up small creatures. Yes. Wow. You got a name for this guy? What do you think? Um, hmm. Big Mouth McGee. Big Mouth McGee, what a good name for an alien. <laughs> well, I think that's probably the best we're gonna do. Awesome, good job, Miss Claire. You did great on making that animal. Now, she did a really good job without knowing any of the adaptations of the animals that you could find on that planet, right? She used her brain and thought, what would make a good adaptation if you're living on that planet? So she made that large mouth. She has those fins on there. She did a really good job. Now, some other animals, like animals that live here on Earth that would live in that type of environment would be maybe an alligator. Right? All right? And this is some alligator skin. Now, alligators, like on uh, Naboo, there's some dangerous predators around, right? And even though an alligator is a predator and does hunt, they still have to protect themselves. So they do have this very thick armor, okay? They actually have bones underneath their skin that act as armor, and those are called ostroderms. Pretty cool, All right? Another really cool adaptation uh, that some animals have that live in a water type environment are these type of feet. Check that out. These are web feet. Obviously, these are used like paddles to paddle their way through the water. But another way that these feet can be useful is if they're walking on mud. Have you guys ever walked on mud before? Think about it. What happens? You sink right down into the mud and you get kind of stuck, right? So. These web feet will help them stay on the surface of the water. Okay. 
Another really cool thing, check this out. This is from a great blue heron. We have these around here in Oklahoma. Great blue heron. And check out this beak. This beak is specially adapted for them to do what? If you said hunt, you got it right. So they catch their prey with this sharp beak. Okay, pretty cool. So they use it, stab that fish, and then they can eat it. All right, well we've had some really, a lot of fun with you today uh, going over adaptations. We love this, uh, we love Star Wars, so we wanted to bring that to you. Uh, May the 4th be with you. Um, remember, my name is Katie, and I'm one of the education managers here at the Tulsa Zoo. I had Claire with me today. Claire is one of our education specialists, and uh, we really enjoyed speaking with you today. And uh, may the fourth be with you. <laughs> 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 <laughs>